Gracious Father in heaven, we thank you today for this opportunity we have to meet, to praise you, and to learn more of you. We pray, Father, for those that are unable to join us right now. We ask, Father, for your guidance, for your direction, and for your blessing. Help us now, direct us so that that which we do and that which we learn may bring glory to your name, to your character, and for the work that you would have us to do on this earth. Thank you for this. For this we praise you. For this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, where we left off last week is in Manuscript 41, 1906. I'm going to recap just a few of the, of the paragraphs, and then we're going to get into the balance that we had not covered. There is to be at this period a series of events which will reveal that God is the master of the situation. The truth will be pro proclaimed in a clear, unmistakable language. Those who preach the truth will strive to demonstrate the truth by a well-ordered life and godly conversation. And as they do this, they will become powerful in advocating the truth and in giving it the sure application that God has given it. The message that is going to be given is going to be proclaimed like a trumpet. It is going to be clear. It is going to be unmistakable. It is going to be very direct. It is going to be unlike anything that has been presented by the church at any point in time. The truth as it is in Jesus, as it was proclaimed by him when he was enshrouded in the pillar cloud, is verity and truth in this our day and will just as surely renovate the mind of the receiver as it has renovated minds in the past. Christ has declared, if they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. What does it mean to us when a mind is renovated? What does it mean to us to think that a dwelling is renovated? How do you apply this? Can we renovate anything if it is filled with garbage? No, it would be have to be cleared out and the old is generally replaced, replaced with the new. Exactly. So here we're given the example where Christ was in the enshrouded in the pillar cloud. How were the children of Israel to look upon that cloud? Was that cloud not a visual representation, not only of the power of God, but of their true leader? So is this not how we are to look upon Christ today? Yes. As a people, we must prepare the way of the Lord under the overruling guidance of the Holy Spirit for the spread of the gospel in its purity. The stream of living water is to deepen and widen on its course. In all fields, nigh and afar off, men will be called from the plow and from the more common commercial business vocations that largely occupy the mind and will become educated in connection with men who have had experience, men who understand the truth. Through most wonderful workings of God, mountains of difficulties will be removed and cast into the sea. What do we see 
when waters are becoming deeper and wider. Are in when when I've swum in the past, deep water has been that where you cannot touch bottom, you must be able to understand where you are at and to focus on the effort that it takes to navigate through the deep water that you're in. Otherwise, you're not going to make it. When the men who have known and taught the truth turn aside unto their own human understanding and meet out to deceive minds their own dish of fables, it is high time for those who have been drawn away into the management of restaurants to come into line, study their Bibles diligently, and with the word of God in their hand, let there be created a restaurant from whence may be served Bible food, rich and immortalized by the cooperation of heavenly angels with the human agencies. This kind of work now calls for the workmen of divine appointment. Omnipotence will then say to the mountains of difficulty, be thou removed and cast into the sea. The message that means so much to the dwellers upon the earth will be seen and understood. Men will know what is truth. Onward and still onward is the work to advance. The most marked events of providence will be seen and recognized. And it will be seen that the truth bears away the victory. We must look upon the work, the message that is to be given as something to be consumed. We must look that we cannot provide a message that we do not understand. We have a direction that is being given that we are to present the pure word. We are to present the wholesome word just as it is found within scripture. Does this allow us to set aside any part of scripture No. Does it allow us to set aside any part of the spirit of prophecy? No. Nothing. If we are not to set these aside, are, are we then to present it completely and accept it completely? I mean, I'm I've been dealing with issues with others that I care about where questions were being raised. Should we accept this portion of what Mrs. White has written? Should we accept that? Is Mrs. White, as I have been stating, a prophet? Do we accept her as a prophet? If she is a prophet, is she not giving the same message as the prophets that we find within the canon of scripture? Many times the excuse has been being used that she is the lesser light. She is the white. She is still giving light onto the word of God. We need to accept for ourselves 
individually. The word of God as we find it in scripture, the word of God as we find it in the spirit of prophecy. To all students, we would say, in the name of the Lord, do not permit yourselves to be held where the spiritual atmosphere is poisoned with a skepticism and falsehood, as it is today in some places. Those who have had the evidence of truth, but who for days, for weeks, for months, and years have had about them a subtle influence that gives a false representation to the truth of God, are not fit teachers for our youth. Where falsehoods are reported as truths is no place for students who are preparing for the future immortal life. We are seeking heaven, wherein can enter none who have changed the truth of God into a lie. How powerful is that statement? We would apply this easily to those that would state that a common work day has been hallowed as a day of rest. But can we apply this to those who would set aside portions of scripture? Can we apply this to those that would choose to set aside the words of Sister White? Let every soul who shall read these words understand that any and every large and stupendous event connected with the providences of God that have established the truth is charged with great results. Truth has a spiritual influence. It enters the mind, direct and uncorrupted, from one who is truth. The reception of truth in the inward parts is charged with the greatest results. Truth is to be received into the heart and developed and expressed in the character. Now, in this situation, truth is to be received into the heart and developed and expressed in the character. Is this not a direct reference to that which we read a couple of weeks ago about the invitation to the feast? We have all been invited. The world has been invited. But how many will choose to come to the wedding feast when they must put on a different garment? What are your thoughts? No lie is of the truth. On every occasion possible, Satan is on hand to introduce the leaven of his deceptive fallacies. Listen not a moment to the interpretations that would loosen one pin, remove one pillar from the structure of truth. One pin, one pillar. What is the central pillar? of the Seventh-day Adventist message. Daniel chapter 8, verse 14. Okay, which is the 2300 days, right? Yes. What is the foundation of the Seventh-day Adventist message? Because you can't have a pillar without a foundation. We connected the foundations to the charts. The foundations with the charts. I've always looked at it that 
the 2520, the understanding of Leviticus 26 is our foundation. Because without that portion of the foundation, would we have come to understand the 2300 days? We cannot remove one pillar. We cannot remove one pin. We cannot choose to loosen one pin from the structure of truth. Human interpretations, the reception of fables will spoil your faith, confuse your understanding, and make of none effect the truth, which means everything to those who have an understanding of the word and who have held fast the form of doctrine that they have received and learned as represented in the third of Revelation. Here again, along with this, the message of Zephaniah, Mrs. White ties the third chapter of Revelation. Here we have the message to Philadelphia. We have the message to Laodicea. And what other message do we have in the third chapter of Revelation that is to be applied here? Artists? Yes. Read this chapter. Herein is pointed out the danger of losing your hold upon the things that you have heard and learn from the source of all light for something new. Hold fast, fast, saith the great teacher. Let those who have been deceived come into line and hold fast the truth. Let it not be taken away from you. Particularly read the first three verses of the third of Revelation. Study the words carefully. Those who can, let us turn now to the third chapter of Revelation. Now, here we have the message to Sardis. And unto the angel of the church of Sardis write, These things saith he that hath the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know thy works, that thou hast a name that thou livest and art dead. How can you have a name that you're living, but you are dead? Be watchful and strengthen the things that remain, that are ready to die, for I have not found thy works perfect before God. This portion is almost as fearful as that which is given to Laodicea. Remember therefore how thou hast received and heard, and hold fast and repent. If therefore thou shalt not watch, I will come upon thee as a thief, and thou shalt not know what hour I will come upon thee. Thou hast a few names even in Sardis, which have not defiled their garments, and they shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. He that overcometh, the same shall be clothed in white raiment, and I will not blot out his name out of the book of life, but I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Are we, like Sardis, to be dead? At this point, can we say that those in Sardis that have a name but aren't dead are taking the name of the Lord in vain?
what I you think you, yeah I think you could make that application okay why repent because there have come in faults in the form of theories so subtle that by the influence of mind upon mind through the agency of those who have departed from the faith and have given heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, the wily foe will cause you imperceptibly to become imbued with the spirit actuating the ones who have beguiled you from the faith. Brothers and sisters, how many do we know that have chosen once to give this message and have now chosen to walk away from it? How many do we know that have chosen to take the name of God, but to ignore the prophetic understanding of all that is being given as light today? Hold fast. We must repent, but we must hold on to that which God has given us. We cannot accept theories. We cannot accept man's interpretation. We must let scripture explain itself. Can someone else read Revelation 3, verses 7 to 13? And to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, These things saith he that is holy, he that is true, he that hath the key of David, he that openeth and no man shutteth, and shutteth and no man openeth. I know thy works. Behold, I have set before thee an open door, and no man can shut it. For thou hast a little strength, and hast kept my word, and hast not denied my name. Behold, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan, which say they are Jews and are not. But do lie, behold, I will make them to come and worship before thy feet, and to know that I have loved thee. Because thou hast kept the word of thy patience, I also will keep thee from the hour of temptation, which shall come upon all the world, to try them that dwell upon the earth. Behold, I come quickly. Hold that fast which thou hast, that no man take thy crown. Him that overcometh will I make a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go no more out, and I will write upon him the name of my God, and the name of the city of my God, which is in New Jerusalem, which cometh down out of heaven from my God, and I will write upon him my new name. Did you say 13 as well? Sorry, Dwight. Yes, yes I did. Okay. He that hath an ear... Let him hear what the Spirit says unto the churches. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. If I was to distill this, it would be pay attention. All of these admonitions are for us today. We cannot afford to have a name and be as one dead, as we see in Sardis. To be given the commendation that is given with Philadelphia is indeed a high honor. But that high honor 
then segues into a type of degradation for this at the last. Because as we read to the church in Laodicea and unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, these things saith the amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know thy works, that thou art neither hot nor cold. I would thou wert hot or cold, cold or hot, excuse me. So then, because thou art lukewarm, neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Because thou sayest, I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing, and knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich, and white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear, and anoint thine eyes with eye salve, that thou mayest see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock, if any man heareth my voice, and open the door. I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame and am set down with my father in his throne. He that heareth hath an ear, let him hear what the spirit saith unto the churches. The admonition given to Laodicea is not pretty. But there is a promise to those that are willing to listen, that are willing to open the door, that are willing to overcome. We are to hold on to the faith that we are given. Anything less is to fail. There are many who are in a perilous position spiritually, many who are ready to die. The revelator was bidden to write to the church in Sardis, these things saith he that hath the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know thy works, that thou hast a name that thou livest and art dead. Be watchful and strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die. For I have not found thy works perfect before God. Remember, therefore, how thou hast received and heard and hold fast and repent. There is a censure resting upon those who have heard the truth, received the truth, and then have acted as men spiritually dead. Remember, therefore, is our work. Remember, therefore. In our work, we are not to be drawn into any plausible theories that will lead us to deny our past faith in the truth that we have heard and advocated. If therefore thou shalt not watch, I will come on thee as a thief, and thou shalt not know what hour I will come upon thee. Thou hast a few names even in Sardis, which have not defiled their garments, and they shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. Moreover, I will make a covenant of peace with them. It shall be an everlasting covenant with them. And I will place them and multiply them and will set up my sanctuary in the midst of them forevermore. My tabernacle also shall be with them 
Yea, I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Revelation combined with Ezekiel. The symbols that we are given are those that would hold to their faith that would become that of the living stones of his tabernacle, of his temple. We cannot afford to hear the truth, to receive the truth, and then to reject the truth. We cannot afford to be as one dead, to be asleep. We are to remember. Okay. We have just a few minutes remaining. Then we're going to need to switch over to continue this to finish the next five or six paragraphs of this unpublished letter. Any comments at this time? Any thoughts? Where are you going to switch over to, Dwight? We're going to be making a switch over to Stephen's Zoom, and there'll be an email that's going to be coming out here very quickly, as well as, I believe, a, a notice on WhatsApp. Just like the notice we just had. Okay, thank you. You bet. Any other questions at this point? When we, when we rejoin together, we're going to recover just a little bit of, of what we just went through and then finish off the rest of this document. The document that we're going to use next Sabbath is, is going to be fairly direct and fairly blunt. So for the moment, let us close with prayer. Heavenly Father, we have great need of you. As we leave one meeting room and then join in another, guide us, please. Be with us, each one. Show us that that you would have us to do. Help us now. Show us that that we need for this day. Please give us meat in due season. For this, we thank you. For this, we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay. Thank you again, brothers, for, for all your efforts this morning. Now, as we continue, um, we'll offer a, a word of prayer and then and go back into the study. Gracious Father in heaven, we thank you again for this opportunity we have to meet together. We ask, Father, for your blessing on the efforts of those that have made this possible. We thank you for this opportunity. We ask for your guidance and direction so that all that we address and all that we see, that we may learn and grow to give glory to your name and show your character to all the, of those with whom we come in contact. For this, we praise you and thank you today in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, as we were just addressing, we have this portion of Revelation that is also being combined with Ezekiel 37. This last scripture carries our minds forward to the triumph of Israel and Judah. 
So this last scripture carries us forward to the joining of the two sticks. The accomplishment of the work will be through human instrumentalities charged with divine power. All the glory is ascribed to the great power of God, but it is through unity and cooperation of the human with the divine that the result is made possible. Humanity blended with divinity grasps the divine efficiency and the work is complete. We cannot accomplish this without the divine power. We cannot, as have others in the past, say that we are doing this for God. This work is being done under the power of God through the human, the frail body. We have been filled with pain of heart, which language cannot describe. As we have seen the work that should have been conducted in the purest channels as a means of bringing souls to a knowledge of the truth, but has proved a snare to capture talents of influence that might have been used in feeding souls with the bread of life. Souls are perishing without a knowledge of the truth. They have not the bread of life to feed upon. God calls for a great work to be done. Shall our hygienic restaurants prove a snare, a mere commercial advantage, and their influence end here? God has not been glorified in any special manner by the hygienic restaurants as ordinarily conducted. It was supposed that much good would be done by preparing food for worldlings, that thereby many would be brought to a knowledge of the truth. But talent has been bound up in enterprises that are run largely on a commercial basis for the temporal advantages to be gained. <clears throat> this has become a snare, as it were, to hold talent that is to be trained by study and diligent working with souls. God calls upon his servants to take up the work that has been committed to everyone who believes. Who is being referred to here? Those who believe the Bible are being called God's servants. Does this mean that, only, that those that believe only part of the Bible are God's service? Or are, is it those that believe the entire Bible are God's servants? The end of all things is at hand. Let no one delay. The leaven of evil has been introduced. We must learn to fulfill God's purposes. If the leaven of evil has been introduced, how quickly does that leaven permeate the entire lump, the entire work. We are to be on guard. We are to be prepared. We are to meet these fallacies, these theories, as directly and completely as we are instructed.
those who once were teachers of righteousness, but have, but who have turned from the truth are wandering in the midst of error. How many can we think of that have turned from the truth? That have set aside their understanding of the seven times of Leviticus 25 and 26. That have set aside their understanding of Mrs. White as a prophet. That have set aside the health message. Where are they now? They are wandering in the mists of error. If there is one thing, brothers and sisters, that we cannot afford to be doing, we cannot afford to be wandering. We can especially not afford to wander in the mists of error. Satan, with much persistency, is striving for the mastery. Christ calls upon those who are still at Battle Creek to obtain a class of education of a character altogether different from the education that they have been receiving there. This was written in 1906. This was written after the Nashville warning. This was written 116 years ago. If this warning was being given to the heart of the work at that time, how much more is this to be given to the heart of the movement today? Students, this is all of us. There is none of us that is greater than any of the others. We are all students. We are all here today together to learn of Christ, to learn of his character, and to learn of that that is expected of us. Students, the Lord Jesus calls upon you to fulfill his commission given just before his ascension to meet the heavenly armies that escorted him to the city of God there to be glorified with that most precious company of saints that were resurrected when gloom came about the crucified redeemer, when awful darkness covered the dying sufferer, when the rocks rent, and men were terrified and exclaimed, this was the son of God that was crucified. Matthew 27, 52 to 54. That resurrected company represented those who would come forth from their graves after the time of trouble that is to come upon our world. Those who come forth from their graves appeared before their believing relatives and bore their testimonies before them. We have not yet come to the time of trouble. For if we had, there would be those that would have come forth from their graves. Is this not what Sister White is saying here? Is this not her testimony? We have the battle of tribulation before us, but our commission is, go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Matthew 28, 19 and 20. Who will pass this by and continue in commercial business that will not bring souls to Christ? 
Shall this condition change? Will you give the last note of warning to the world? Who is this written to? Is this not being presented to each of us today? Is this not the clarion call to us each to be prepared to leave the plow, to give a message, to be fitted by Christ for the work that is to be done? Now, the next document here is a letter that was written to Mrs. White's son and daughter-in-law, May 10th of 1906. The letter was fully published in 21 manuscript release, pages 85 to 89. To Elder J.E. White and wife, children Edson and Emma. I address you a few lines this morning. I have begun letters to you during the past weeks, but have been unable to finish them. This morning I am weak because of an attack of influenza that came upon me during our visit to Southern California. While at the Paradise Valley Sanitarium, I drove to San Diego to speak in the church there. And then, after taking a cold bath, I drove back to the sanitarium nearly seven miles. This did not seem to worry me, but afterward, I was traveling from place to place, bearing heavy burdens. And in some way, I contracted a cold that it has been very difficult for me to throw off. While we were at the Paradise Valley Sanitarium, the institution was dedicated. Early in the afternoon of April 24th, the invited guests and many friends of the sanitarium began to come onto the ground to inspect the buildings. The dedicatory exercises passed off very pleasantly. Elder Stephen N. Haskell was on the program as the first speaker, but his train was late, so I spoke first on the theme In Touch with Nature. I began by reading a portion of the 42nd of Isaiah in which scripture are emphasized the power of Jehovah, his care for his people and his yearning desire to bring under his beneficent care those who are ignorant of his purposes concerning them. Through the prophet Isaiah, Jehovah, he that created the heavens and stretched them forth, he that spread abroad the earth and that which cometh out of it, he that giveth breath unto, his peop unto the people upon it, and spirit to them that must walk therein, declares to his people, I, Jehovah, have called thee in righteousness, <clears throat> and will hold thy hand, <clears throat> and will keep thee, and will give thee for a covenant of the people for a light of the Gentiles, to open the blind eyes, to bring out the prisoners from the dungeon and them that sit in the darkness out of the prison house. Sing unto Jehovah a new song and his praise from the end of the earth. Isaiah 42 verses 5 to 7 and 10. Have we all not been captives to sin? Have we all not sat in the darkness in the dungeon? Have we all not been in prison of our own making? I related some of my early experiences in caring for the sick and showed how outdoor life, exercise, and good food in connection with the best of treatments and faith in God's healing power 
will do wonders in the restoration of health. Elder Haskell spoke next on the healing of one sick of the palsy. Brother J.F. Ballinger offered the dedicatory prayer. Elder Reeser was the chairman of the afternoon service. While many of the guests were looking over the buildings and the grounds, I had a very interesting interview with Dr. Mary L. Potts, the one who formerly owned the property, now known as the Paradise Valley Sanitarium. Mrs. Potts is one year younger than I am and seems to be a woman of ability. <clears throat> she is an exceptional speaker and is still going from place to place to deliver public lectures on health and temperance. During the evening exercises, she spoke before the large assembly and told the story of her effort to establish and maintain a sanitarium home in this beautiful place and of her pleasure that the work she was unable to carry on is now taken up by us. She seemed to be very thankful that the place is in such good hands. I had a long talk with Dr. Potts and gave her a copy of Ministry of Healing. She told me that the original sanitarium building had cost her $25,000. It is a three-story structure and beside the basement and the garret, all finished with excellent taste and wise calculation. The parlors and sitting room and dining room are well arranged and built for the comfort and the health of the patients. There are several bay windows and the building stands so that the sunshine enters the rooms to the best possible advantage. The new addition to the main buildings in the form of a long L with well-arranged bathrooms on one end. The second floor has been finished for the accommodation of patients. The third floor is not yet finished, but will be arranged as a dormitory for the helpers. Now, May 26th. There is a general feeling of uncertainty, a trembling in regard to the future events, for at times there is a trembling of the earth. I am now at work preparing some articles for the papers or for publication in some other form. Now, while men and women are thinking seriously, I can make a strong point on the Sunday question and on the closing of liquor saloons. I mean to speak quite strongly on these points. Here she is tying the Sunday law along with the curse of liquor. Light has been given me that as we near the close of this earth's history, we shall have the scenes of San Francisco calmly, uh, the San Francisco calamity repeated in other places. And I do not wish, do not want to gather strength that I may be able to stand before the people and bear a clear, decided testimony. So I do want to gather the strength to stand before the people and bear a clear, decided testimony. The period of time in which we are living is a very solemn one. We had quite a shaking up in our houses here at home. Chimneys were thrown down, but no great damage was done. The printing plant at Mountain View suffered considerably. The side and the back walls of the factory were shaken down. The front remained standing. The new post office building just finished was a complete wreck. And some large store buildings were also in ruins. Several other buildings in Mountain View were twisted and broken in pieces, more or less. In San Jose, many of the buildings were ruined and many chimneys were thrown down. These things 
make me feel very solemn because I know that judgment, the judgment day is right upon us. What is the judgment day? What symbol do we apply as the judgment day? What symbol? Would it not be the 10th day of the seventh month? What say you? Would you agree or disagree? Agree. The judgments that have already come are a warning, but not the finishing punishment that will come upon wicked cities. When the judgment comes upon Nashville, is that the final warning? Or is that just the beginning of what's going to happen? I would look upon it as the beginning. Would you have a problem with that? No. 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 Our cities are most terrible places wherein are practiced all kinds of sin and iniquity of the most revolting character. The Lord's name is greatly dishonored. Herein, she is giving a warning to us. Right now, we are living in the heavenly day of atonement, the heavenly 10th day of the seventh month. There is more that we will address about this subject this coming week. At this point, October 22nd, 1844, was the opening of the 10th day of the seventh month in the heavenly calendar. We have yet to reach the close of the 10th day of the seventh month of the heavenly calendar. <coughs> We are living definitely in a solemn time. There is much for us all to consider. There is much for us all to be concerned about. When we reached San Francisco on our way home, we took a carriage and rode through the streets of the city for an hour and a half. We went up to Van Ness Avenue and onto our church building. The meeting house is still standing. It has sustained some damage, but it can soon be repaired. It would have been a hard matter to arouse courage sufficient to rebuild if it had been destroyed. Beautiful Jefferson Park, close by the church property, is filled with tents and with people. San Francisco in ruins is the most complete, thorough, and awful calamity I have ever looked upon. In the night season, I have had many presentations of the judgment of God coming upon our cities. And now I can understand better the real meaning of these scenes that I have witnessed. In Micah, we read. Can someone please read these first three verses of Micah? I'll read it, Dwight. I'll read it. Thank you. Let William read. 
Kentucky, if you, if you don't mind. Walking, O earth, and all that therein is, and let the Lord God be witness against you, the Lord from his holy temple. For behold, the Lord cometh from out of his place, and will come down and tread upon the high places of the earth. And the mountain shall be melted under him, and the valley shall be cleaved and waxed before the fire. And, uh, and as the waters that are poured out and spilled steep places. Sorry about that. Not a problem. <clears throat> and the mountain shall be molten under him. Okay. And the valley shall be cleft as wax before the fire. And as the waters that are poured down a steep place. How many times have we seen a waterfall? How many times has that waterfall been in great power? How quickly does wax melt before a fire? Or does it stand? Does it stand before the fire without any issue? All of this is coming to happen on this earth. Now we have three more verses to read. All right. Michael 1 5. For the transgression of Jacob is all this and for the sins of the house of Israel. What is the transgression of Jacob? Is it not Samaria? And what are the high places of Judah? Are they not Jerusalem? Therefore, I will make Samaria as an heap of the field and as plantings of a vineyard. And I will pour down the stones thereof into the valley and I will discover the foundations thereof. And all the graven images thereof shall be beaten to pieces, and all the hires thereof shall be burned with the fire, and all the idols thereof will I lay desolate, for she gathered it of the hire of an harlot, and they shall return to the hire of an harlot. <clears throat> At this point. Consider these six verses as we walk through this, this coming week. We are going to be returning to this part of the study this next week. We are going to be returning to symbols specifically of the 10th day of the seventh month this coming week. Give consideration to that which we have read. Give consideration to that which we have discussed. Be prepared so that this message, this message in Micah, acclaimed as a minor prophet, as has been Zephaniah, as has been Haggai, as has been many others, may also be compared with what we have studied in Daniel chapters 9, 10, 11, and 12. For all of this adds elements for us today. All of this is for our admonition at this time. As we prepare to close, are there any other thoughts, comments, or questions? Shall we then pray? Gracious Father in heaven, we thank you for this opportunity that we've had to meet. We ask, Father, for your blessing 
and for your guidance throughout this Sabbath day for all of the other meetings that will occur. We ask your blessing, Father, upon those that were not able to join us today. Please be with Theodore and Heidi in all that they are doing. Please be with those that were unable to join in this meeting because of the short notice. I thank you for those that have been here, that have contributed, that have listened. Please be with us now throughout this day. May each have a blessing upon this Sabbath so that we may more fully turn our minds to you in all things that you would have us to do. Thank you for this opportunity and for this time, for we need you in all ways and in all things. Direct us now, be with us. In Jesus' name, we thank you. Amen.